Today, we begin a fresh start together as one Kentucky. Of Kentucky. So help me God. I want to start by saying thank you. There are so many people. When we announced our candidacy back 10, 11 months ago, I put out what I called a blueprint for a better Kentucky. We talked about streamlining government. We've already begun. We talked about modernizing and simplifying our tax code. We talked about health care. And I'll tell you, we will provide true access to the health care system and not just lip service. We talked about school choice. This is one of seven states where there is no competition. That is going to end. We talked about auditing the pension plans, and I will tell you, we are going to audit every single pension plan in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. My challenge to you now is to focus on that which unites us. Together, we will accomplish great things. Together, we will serve as a beacon to our fellow Kentuckians, and we will serve as a beacon to the rest of our nation and to the rest of our world as well. And I'll tell you, we're blessed. This is an extraordinary state. The power to stand united is within each and every one of us. This is our Kentucky. This is our opportunity. This is our ability to become the greatest version of ourselves that we could possibly be. And we will do this because we are Kentucky. Thank you and God bless you. good enthusiasm here. Thank you for this welcome. Uh, it is humbling to be here, to say the very least. It's remarkable uh, in many respects. Uh, the largest previous amount of enthusiasm I've seen in this room, other than when I was here for mock convention, was the occasional WNL Roanoke game uh, for basketball, which I don't know if that's a big deal anymore. Uh, but I've had occasion to share some stories with my children as we were driving over here for this convention. I have two of my nine children with me today, two ninths of my crew. I have 15-year-old twin daughters uh, who are here. I won't ask them to stand up. They're already mortified that I'm talking about them. Uh, they have feathered their way into the Kentucky contingent uh, and uh, represent. We got a couple other people. I noticed we had a Pennsylvanian and I think a, a uh, Coloradan had also worked their way in there. So I guess it's where the cool kids are. I was struck by I was struck by something actually when he was introduced, uh, Professor Hoover, Hoover, I mean you guys were all giving him the hoof, the, uh, he's a guy, I had an occasion some time ago, let me just start by saying I don't really have a speech, I was in the library, I was in the library an hour ago realizing this is kind of a big deal and I should probably put some thoughts down on paper, somebody asked me, Somebody asked me this morning, you know, they said, we look forward to hearing what you have to say, and, and I said, so do I, actually. So, <laughs> so I, I'll try not to be too random in some of my comments, but, but anyhow, I wanted to share, you an interesting, share with you an interesting story. Professor Hoover and I had one of the greatest memories that I have that happened on this campus. It didn't happen, actually, when I was a student. But some years later, when I had occasion uh, to come back and guest lecture, and it was when the school, for the only time, I believe, since Robert E. Lee lived in his house, that the president of the university did not live in the house. Uh, it was an interim period. Uh, the previous president had left. The acting president had a place in town, and so the house was open. And so I was asked, would I be interested in staying at the Lee house? And I thought, are you kidding me? That would, how sweet would that be? So I had occasion to be there. I was the only one in the house. And Professor Hoover came over, and the two of us stayed up talking till about 1 o'clock in the morning. And then he left and went home, and it was just me. And, uh, and I went up, and I don't know if any of you have been upstairs in there. Probably a number of you have not. But if you go upstairs, Robert E. Lee's bedroom was, the, was on the left-hand side. And I was staying, actually, in a room on the other side of the hall. But I went up, and from 1 to 2 o'clock in the morning... I just sat in that room, Robert E. Lee's bedroom, with my back against the wall, just sitting on the floor, and just listening to the house. I know that sounds strange, sounds odd, but this is a community, this is a school, this is a campus, this is an institution that is just powerfully full of unbelievable history, unbelievable memories, unbelievable moments in time that have transformed the world as we know it. 
And I think about the conversations that must have taken place, quiet, private conversations that he had, perhaps some that he had for people to hear, perhaps some with himself. And I sat there on the floor and just listened to the house move for an hour. And I got up at 2 o'clock, walked across the hall, and went to sleep. One of the greatest moments of my life. I was so privileged to have that opportunity. Uh, and I'm just grateful for all that has gone into making this possible. I look around here. I should probably start, frankly, by pointing out what happened to my hand. Because otherwise, I'm going to have to explain it to all of you afterwards, as I have been thus far. I was playing freeze tag in the dark with my children. And I went down on a piece of gravel. And, it, and, it, and, and for those of you that are pre-med folks or biology or physiology students or whatever the case might be, you may be aware of what I was not, nor are probably most of you, the fact that every one of us have two trapeziums in your body. There is a trapezium here and a trapezium here. One of my trapeziums is in one piece, the other trapezium is in three pieces. So this is why I'm wearing this little club thing. I, I was joking with somebody, I said I have discovered some of those liberal Democrats to be more hard-headed than I had anticipated, actually, <laughs> since I became governor, but that's not really what happened. Matt, who introduced me, thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction, Matt, and I noticed when he said that he is mocking as a Republican, but that in real life as a Democrat, he was indeed helpful to my first campaign, and I'm grateful for that. But I noticed when he said that, that there was a fair amount of hooting and hollering that seemed to be coming from that region. I don't know why all the Democrats have been moved to the back, but I think it's appropriate in some measure. I don't know that it's a bad thing, but I did notice that was where most of the noise came from. I will say this, though, in a reminder, and perhaps you've heard this, Winston Churchill, who I may refer to later on if I remember to and come back off of a rabbit trail I've taken myself on, Winston Churchill once noted, and I'm paraphrasing, that show me a young person who's not a liberal and I'll show you somebody with no heart. He said, show me an older person who's not a conservative and I'll show you someone with no brains. And so I would simply say there is time, there is time, some clearly are a little more ahead of the curve in terms of their ideology. But there is time for all. And even to my friend Matt, even to my friend Matt, I would say it's never too late to do the right thing. So I would, I, here, here's the bottom line. I was thinking about how do you present yourself to people? How do you start out having this kind of a discussion uh, and, and articulate kind of where you've come from and, and how do you impart something meaningful in the course of an hour or as much of that as I'm able to fill up uh, in the next little bit. How do you leave something meaningful? I was reminded of a story of a third grade teacher. She had a bunch of little students and she asked them each to, to draw a picture of anything they'd like, anything at all. And so as they drew pictures, she circulated around amongst their desks and uh, she saw little Sally drawing something and she couldn't quite figure out what it was and she said Sally what what is that 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 you're drawing a picture of and Sally said well this is I, I'm drawing a picture of God and her teacher said well Sally um, nobody nobody knows what God looks like and little Sally said well they will in a minute <laughs> and uh, and I don't know if in a minute or an hour uh, I will leave with you something worth taking away but I hope that I will I want to share a few thoughts with you some of them are more serious than others. I first came to this school 31 years ago when I was the age of some of you in this room, older than some, younger than others. 31 years ago, I came here as a freshman. It was the first time I ever saw the campus. I'd never been here before. I came because I believed in its history. I believed in its ideology. I believed in the speaking tradition and the honor code and the fact that the teachers who taught in the classrooms were not, you know, teaching assistants or people who might have otherwise been not as qualified, but were rather the real professors, the people that you could talk to. These were the things that motivated me and moved me as a simple little country kid from northern New Hampshire. I was one of only two kids from New Hampshire that was in school at WNL at that time. A little whistle from, is this the New Hampshire people over here somewhere? There we go, outstanding. There weren't many of us. And I had come down here and I was struck because we got here in the evening and it was the fall They'd recently cut the grass. And any of you who have walked across that campus early in the morning or late in the evening when the grass has been cut, there's just a certain smell. There's a certain beauty of it. 
And we parked down below in the little parking lot down below the Lee Chapel and walked up onto the colonnade. That was the first time I ever saw this school. Stunning, beautiful, beautiful. And all of you will leave this place. All of you will leave this place remembering the beauty of the physical campus. And you will leave this place remembering the professors who changed you, molded you, challenged you, shaped you. And I hope you do. But I want to challenge you with one thing. There was some reference made to the fact that I spent a lot of time working in the dining hall, and I did. I worked about 20 to 30 hours a week while I was a student here. Worked in the dining hall, worked student security, did landscaping, different things. Some of the greatest people in this town, some of the greatest people on this campus are not the people that are standing in front of you at the front of the classroom every day. They are among the greatest as well. But some of the greatest are some you may not even know. For those of you that are seniors in particular, I challenge you, I challenge you, find at least one person who works on this campus that is currently invisible to you. There are hundreds of them. They cut the grass, they paint things, they fix things, they file things, they replace light bulbs, they type things, they move things, they repair things, they cook things, they clean things up. And they are as integrally a part of who you are and what you will leave this place with as anyone that is currently in your mind when you think about how you're being shaped by this incredible institution. And so I challenge you to find them, find these people. Find at least one person before you leave. Introduce yourself to them. Take the time to find their story. Take the time to find out who they are, to know how it is that they have touched students through the years because they are shaping you as well. I'm humbled as well to be here as the governor of Kentucky because there were three governors from Kentucky. I don't know if this has been mentioned. I haven't heard everything that's been said. Perhaps it's known, perhaps it's not. Three governors of Kentucky have come to Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. Did you all know that? That was news to me. The first was a fellow who came here when it was Washington College. There's now a county named after him, Crittenden. Came here when it was Washington College. The second was a fellow who was fairly well known more for his lieutenant governor, a fellow whose name is Happy Chandler and was fairly famous and infamous both in Kentucky and beyond. Ultimately became a commissioner of baseball and other things and he was the lieutenant governor of, under the second WNL graduate who was a graduate of WNL's law school. Ruby LaFoon was his name. Ruby LaFoon. Governor LaFoon perhaps most changed the world, however, by in Kentucky, we have a thing that allows you to be colonized, and the governor has the authority to make people Kentucky colonels. And so you can be deemed a Kentucky colonel as somebody who is emblematic of the things, the values, the principles, the willingness to be proud of and spread the word of all good things Kentucky. And the perhaps most famous Kentucky colonel of them all is one that is best known for his chicken, and that is Colonel Sanders. And it was interesting, I met a student here as I was walking in, there was a student from Japan uh, who greeted me in Japanese, I have a degree in East Asian studies and uh, used to be fluent in Japanese, but in Japan it's interesting because Colonel Sanders is known as Kentucky Ojisan. And, and Kentucky Ojisan is, sits in, in replica outside every Kentucky Fried Chicken and people love to take pictures with him. But he was made a colonel by a graduate of Washington and Lee University, how about them apples? And, and, and then there's me. So it's kind of a, a pale comparison to those that have preceded me, but you know, we're two months in, who knows what's gonna happen for the next uh, 46 months or so. But it is, it is uh, an honor to be a part of that group, but to also be a graduate of this school in particular. There was a moment of silence given a moment ago to Albin Barkley uh, and the conditions under which his life came to an end, I think you are aware of. It's part of mock convention lore. I will just tell you that as the first statewide elected official from Kentucky to be here since 1956, it's a little, a little daunting, frankly. It's, I, I was talking to somebody, I mean, you couldn't, I mean, how do you top that, really? How do you top that, in all sincerity? 
He was not a young man, and so this wasn't, it was shocking and tragic in some respects, but he was 78 years old. He'd lived an extraordinary life, as had been noted. And my gracious, if you're going to go, what a way to go out. And, and frankly, if you have never heard, and perhaps you have, I hope you have, if you've never listened to his speech, including the very last line of it, the last words he ever spoke, phenomenal, phenomenal. You realize why he was the great leader that he was. Just the voice, the timber, the, the, the command that he had just verbally as you listen to it, and the words themselves, phenomenal. I won't repeat them. I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with, you, with them, to make yourself familiar with them. Let me ask you this. How many of you in, have enjoyed the lineup of people thus far that you've had occasion to hear from? And I was, they really, it is, again, it's an honor for me to be a part of that mix. Newt Gingrich is outstanding. That guy is just always tremendous. You can see why he was a popular professor and, and still is in many respects and just an incredible speaker at every turn. Uh, I was struck by one of the things he said about the greatness of America, though. Do you remember when he was talking about the cab drivers in New York City? You ask the first dozen cab drivers where they're from, you might find they're from eight different countries. Indeed, America is the greatest nation on earth. While I did grow up in a simple little spot, and while I never even flew in an airplane until I was 17 years old, first time I ever flew in an airplane, I didn't have occasion to go and see much when I was young. But I've been blessed with opportunities to be in more than 20% of the countries in the world since that time. I have seen all corners of this globe. And I will tell you, regardless of what our current administration in Washington might think, this is the greatest nation in the entire world. It really is. But I will, I will tell you, this greatness does not come about by accident. This greatness did not happen by coincidence. This greatness came at an extraordinary price. There are even in this room some of whom I met who were uh, graduates with myself who are military veterans. I was a military veteran. And as military veterans, there are those in this room who are going into service, some who are in service now, some who have previously served, those who have served in times of peace and in times of war. I served with guys who paid everything, whose children have grown up without a dad. The sacrifice that has been made has been extraordinary. Our freedom, our liberty, the things we value, the things we take so often for granted in the comfort of a school like this and an opportunity to sit and be a part of an occasion like this, so often we forget of the incredible sacrifice. And so to our military veterans, I say thank you. To those that are protecting us, I say thank you because this was an incredible price that has been paid. You often, you often hear people talk about the, the, the origins of this country, and, and, and indeed we hear it said that this is a government of and by and for the people. What does that mean? What does that mean, of and by and for the people? You're embodying it in some measure. But of and by and for the people is only of any value if we the people take it seriously. If we the people are as engaged as you are engaged in the production of this mock convention. It is pathetic to me. It's embarrassing, frankly, and it saddens me when I think of the sacrifice that has been made. How anemic the turnout is in elections. People don't vote. Why don't they vote? They don't vote because they don't care. Why don't they care? They don't care because they've become jaded and they've become cynical and because they've become soft. The underbelly of America is becoming soft. We've become apathetic in the greatest, greatest demise of any culture from the dawn of time has been apathy. The underbelly becomes soft. People stop caring. And the very things that in this case make us the greatest nation on earth are the most at risk. Our founding fathers pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. That wasn't a campaign slogan. That wasn't a bumper sticker. They meant it. Every one of them gave some or all of those things, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. I want to leave you with an acronym for something. I'm often asked to kind of how, if you had to describe success in some measure, how do you accomplish the things you might pursue? In this room, there are 
any number of talented young people who are going to go on to any number of different careers. I want to leave you with a four-letter acronym of just something to take away my two cents worth on things that I think will hold you in good stead if you were to follow them. Now, there's four letters, H-I-T-S. People talk a lot about getting singles and doubles. I'm just singles and doubles. Just got to get on base. Just make small incremental strides. Those are hits. H-I-T-S. Follow along closely, though, because if you get them out of order, it could come up with a very different analogy and that, <laughs> a, you know, a, acronym, and that's, that's not good. So stay with me. The first one, H, humility. Stay humble. One of the f- best lines I've ever heard, Golda Meir, who was the fourth prime minister of Israel, was once meeting with a dignitary, and I don't even remember who it was. And apparently this particular fellow was a little full of himself, and she looked at him and she said, listen, don't, don't be so humble. You're not that great. And you think about it, be humble. Humility is, is something that the world needs more of. And it's not a false sense of humility. Be humble because truth be told, none of us are that great. We're not. You're not that great, I'm not that great, we're all individuals. We've all started out the same way. Some of us have been given better opportunities, but stay humble. When I took my oath of office a couple of months ago, the Bible that I took my oath of office on was opened to Micah 6, 8. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a passage that says, what is it that God demands of us? What is it that God asks of us? And it is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. This is what is demanded of us. Please, I beg of you, don't ever think that you are the reason for all the blessings that you will have. They transcend you. They they transcend you in both human form and otherwise. We are blessed on this nation and in this time in the history of the world for many reasons beyond our control. Please don't ever think it's all because of what you personally have done, no matter how hard you might have worked. Be humble. Humility is a powerful thing. I want to talk about I. I is integrity. I've had occasion to guest lecture here. I often joke with students that it's, it's, a, it's more than ironic that I've ever come back here to guest lecture. I didn't light this place up academically, I'll tell you that. I did graduate. Uh, I did even make dean's list sometimes, but not consistently. Now, I mean, I couldn't even get in here now. Let's be honest about it. But, the, uh, but that said, clearly there's, there's some path for people like me. Uh, I will say this, though. I've often started out these classes when speaking by asking young people, what is the most important characteristic? If you had to single out a single trait, a single characteristic that would bode you well in life, that would do well by you no matter what it was that you decided to pursue. And invariably, people answer a number of things, but only twice in all the times that I've done it here and at other schools around the country has anybody ever come up with the word that I'm looking for, which is the one that I just shared with you. It's integrity. It doesn't matter what you want to do. People don't work with you. People don't buy from you. People don't seek your services volitionally if they have a choice, if they don't trust you. The cornerstone of trust is integrity. Without integrity, there is no trust. Without trust, there is no relationship. Be men and women of integrity. Take the honor code with you. Be proud of it. Make it an integral part of your lives. Integrity is something that is not easily replaced. Once you've lost it, let your word be your bond at every turn. I'm grateful to have been raised with that understanding. I've done the best I can in my life to honor the way in which I was raised. Integrity is important. Humility and integrity. The T is tenacity. Be tenacious. There was a comment made in the introduction about my first foray into politics. I I didn't study political science. I didn't take a single political science class in my life. While I've always been intrigued by many things, I think it was noted that I'm intellectually curious, and that's true enough. I've always read and I'm intellectually curious, I suppose. And I've always been intrigued by the world of politics, more just because of my frustration with it, I think, than anything else. But I've followed along. I've always voted. I've always been engaged. I've always been as conversant as the next person, and maybe then some. But I've never aspired to be a politically elected person. I never had aspired to find myself out in the public forum in a a situation such as this. 
And yet, there's a time and a place to stand up. The first time that I came forward, I ran against the Senate Minority Leader of the United States. There were people who said, well, you're just trying to be opportunistic. Really? What opportunity would that be? <laughs> Sticking your head in a $20 million buzzsaw, which is what happened. I mean, literally, I was an anonymous guy minding my own business. $20 million later, I was the scourge of the earth and the son of Damien. And that was, and it was literally, and that's what happens. But understand that I didn't go in unmindful of that. I went in fully aware of the fact that no Senate leader, minority leader, majority leader, whip, no leader in the Senate in the history of American politics had ever lost a primary, ever, never. In fact, no such leader had ever gotten less than 75% of the vote in a primary. So I had no dis, you know, delusion that this was going to somehow be easy or simple or even a given. So you would say, why would you do that? I did it because sometimes it's important to rattle the cage. Sometimes it's important to challenge the status quo. Sometimes it's important to create the kind of dialogue we're seeing a lot of in 2016. And no matter what you think about it, it's healthy, it's cathartic, it's good. Be tenacious. Be the people who are willing to step forward. In this gubernatorial race, there were three good people. I knew all of them. I had met with each of them multiple times. I knew them, I knew them well, and every one of them would have been a better alternative than the likely nominee on the other side who became the nominee who was our state's attorney general. It wasn't because there was anything inherently wrong with each of them individually, but when you run for office, and this is something that I think those of you who do study politics understand, you've gotta do three things. You first of all have to win a primary, you have to win a general, and then you have to do the job. And if I had been convinced that the other three individuals could have indeed done all three, it was possible, I wasn't convinced of it, and I knew for a fact I did not want somebody that was likely to be coming from the other side to take our state forward because we can't afford to have continued down the wrong path. It takes a certain amount of tenacity to jump into a race where you're frankly the last guy in. I, I, I signed up to, to, I filed two hours before the deadline, much to the dismay of many. The interesting thing is during the course of the race, literally not one single statewide elected official or even member of our state house or member of our state senate, not one single elected official at that level ever endorsed me or supported me in the primary, not one. We won that election by 83 votes. There's 120 counties. There were hundreds of thousands of votes cast, 83 votes. It was the closest election in the history of Kentucky, one of the closest in a statewide race in the history of America. And again, it wasn't because I was that special. It really wasn't. Things sometimes happen for a reason. I'm not sure that I believe in coincidence. I really don't. And in fact, it's interesting that this was as a result of, I think, in some measure, putting things out there that people say, you can't talk that way, you can't say this, you can't talk about those things. That will offend people. It'll cost you votes. Stop being sheep. Don't let the world encourage you to be sheep. Be bold. Know what you believe and pursue it. Tenacity matters. The S is service. Service more than anything else. If I leave you with nothing else, I beg of you, serve your fellow man. Serve others before you serve yourself. Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman ever elected to the U.S. Congress, and she made note of the fact that service is the rent you pay for space in this world. And I believe that has actually been attributed to other people as well, most often to her. But it's a powerful statement. Every one of us is taking space in this world. What are we doing with it? What is the price that we're paying for it? There's, in the Middle East, two little bodies of water. They're separated by less than 65 miles. They're both fed by the same tributary. The Jordan River feeds into both of them. They're similar in size. They're really more the size of large lakes, but they're seas. One of them has a vibrancy around it. One of them has people building homes around the edges, children splashing in the water, an abundance of fish, trees that are growing, water that's being taken out of there to irrigate surrounding agricultural lands. Less than 65 miles away is another sea fed by the very same Jordan River. There's nothing around the edges. It's the Dead Sea. 
What's the difference? The Sea of Galilee has an outlet. The Sea of Galilee takes water in, but it sends water out. The Dead Sea only takes water in. You all are sucking in an extraordinary gift by being students at Washington and Lee University. By being blessed to be a part of the families that you're a part of, to be members of the greatest nation, to be citizens of America at this time in history. You are receiving things that 99% of people who have ever lived plus have never even imagined, let alone will have any chance to appreciate. Don't keep it to yourselves. Don't suck it in and fail to give it back. There's a huge difference between those who take only for themselves and those who serve. For those of you who will have children, for those of you in this room who do have children, and there's many up on this balcony above us, some of your children are down here. Greatest gift you can give your children is to serve other people with them. Serve other people. Don't just encourage them to get service hours. Don't just send them on service trips. Serve with them. Do things where there is nothing in it for you, where you have nothing to gain, arguably something to lose. It might be dangerous. It might be dirty. It might be tiresome. Do it. It's the greatest gift you can give your child. It is what they will remember. It's what you will remember. And for those of you who don't have children but might someday, take that with you. Serve other people. All these things we talked about, humility, integrity, tenacity, service, they're important. But I'll tell you, so too is enthusiasm. Ralph Waldo Emerson once noted that nothing great is ever achieved without enthusiasm. So I encourage you, be enthusiastic in what you do. Be the person who has the great attitude. Nobody likes the person who sucks everybody down. You know who they are. Some of them are in your dorm. Some of them are in your house. Some of them are in your class. Some of them carpool with you at times, much to your dismay. These are the kind of, you know who these people are. Don't be that person. Don't be them. Be the person who's enthusiastic. Be the person who truly inspires other people, who brings out the greatness in other people. I've read through, there's not one up here, but I was given earlier a copy of the platform that you all have put together. It's extraordinary. And Pascal and others who have put that together, my hat's off to you. Extraordinary document. For all of those of you who worked on that, thank you for that. I've not had a chance to read it as thoroughly as I would like, but as I read through it, I was struck by how all-encompassing it is, how it speaks to the very core principles that we're talking about. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? How many of you have read this document? How many of you have read this platform? Not many hands going up here. It's a little disappointing. You people need to get busy. <laughs> Read it. How many of you are familiar, at least, with some of the things that are in there because you worked on some of them? There's at least one. Outstanding. <laughs> oh, yeah, indeed, mister. <laughs> how many of you, whether you believe it or not, how many of you are willing to fight for those principles? How many of you are... How many are you really? How many of you are willing to fight for those principles? For liberty, for freedom for the pursuit of happiness, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of the happiness, the very inalienable, inalienable rights that, are, and that were endowed within us by our Creator. The government didn't give us these rights. The government did not give us these rights. So one of you believes them. Some of, them, some of you will fight for them. How many of you would die for these principles? How many of you would truly die for these principles? Every one of you is in here. Your parents that are up here and other adults that are here, we, our generation is the first generation leaving you all in worse condition financially, morally, educationally, and otherwise than, frankly, we were left with. With rare exception, sadly, that's true. We are leaving you in almost certain likelihood of being in worse shape than we were given when we came of age as you are now. That's sad. First time in American history. But it's interesting because so many people in here, yourselves included, I would guess, how many of you want a better life? How many of you want a better life for the next generation? My question to you, how badly do you want it? How badly do you want it? Do, do you want it badly enough 
to sacrifice everything for it? Do you want it as badly as the young men who came off the transport carriers on Omaha Beach? They knew they weren't going to get 10 feet up that beach, and most of them didn't. They stepped over the bodies of their friends, on the bodies of their friends. Some fell on top of the bodies of their friends. And the next kids behind them came off those transport carriers and tried to get 10 feet farther up the beach. Do you want it that badly? Do you want it as badly as the men who were in Valley Forge in the winter of 1776, if they were lucky enough to even have shoes, they ate those shoes in order to keep from starving to death. Do you want it that badly? Because if you don't want it that badly, your generation, my generation, if we don't want it that badly, we don't deserve a better America. We don't. Because how outrageous would it be that we assume that a better America will come to us without any level of sacrifice from us. That those who preceded us sacrificed in ways we can't, for the most of us, even imagine. Nor will we ever be expected to give in such a sacrificial way. And yet we are the beneficiaries of it. We are the ones who are blessed to live at this time and place in this nation as a result of that sacrifice. How dare we expect to have a better life and a better future if we're not willing to make sacrifice to make it happen? So what degree of sacrifice are you willing to make? What degree of sacrifice will each and every one of you make now in the days that follow now, in the years that follow now? What sacrifice are you willing to make? Because sacrifice will be demanded of you, some more than others, but it will be demanded of you. My high school yearbook quote was by Ralph Waldo, it was by actually Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And it was a longer poem that is a part of, but the line that I put in my high school yearbook quote was, lives of all great men remind us. We can make our lives sublime and in passing leave behind us footsteps on the sands of time. What footsteps are you leaving? Whose footsteps are you following? How will history remember you? Who are you gonna be when you leave this school? Who are you gonna be when you're out there and the pressure is on and the easy thing is the wrong thing? Who will you be? What footsteps will you lay down for those that follow you? I wanna share something with you uh, give me a moment to look, pull it up. This may be hard for me to share with you. I, I wasn't sure I was going to. This was something written by a teenager, 17 years old. You hold the only piece that can fill the deepest hole, but how do I get it? You said, ask and you shall receive. I am asking, and I know that you will give it to me. Every week you bless me so much and teach me lessons after lessons. I know that once again, you are showing me your love. I can't fathom how much you feel when one of your children suffers, but I've had a glimpse of your heartache. As a new week approaches, my dangerous prayer is that you'll place broken-hearted people in my path and fill me with you so that I can let your love heal their pain. That was written by a 17-year-old girl. Those are the last words she ever wrote. She went to school and she didn't come home. She was a senior in high school. She came to this campus with me. She was my oldest daughter. You don't know how much time you have. No one knows how much time you have. What are you doing with the time you have? What footsteps are you laying down? Whose footsteps are you following? The trajectory of the world will change because of you, for better or for worse, or for nothing. 
History often remembers Winston Churchill, a man we mentioned earlier, as being the Lion of England. He once said, and again I'm paraphrasing him, when he often would hear people saying that he was the Lion of England, I think it bothered him a little bit, even though he wasn't exactly a humble man. He was an incredible man. He had pride, but frankly, many successful people do. But he did seem to be bothered by that moniker. And he once said, it is not me that is the lion. The people of England are the lion. He said, history has called upon me to deliver the roar. Who among you, who among those assembled in this room, who among your generation will step up when time demands it and deliver the roar. One of you, perhaps more than one of you, will be exactly what this world needs at a certain point in time. Will you have it within you? Will you have followed footsteps? Will you have lived your life? Will you have been intentional enough to be in a position to deliver the roar when the roar is demanded of you? We don't live in a stable world, geopolitically and otherwise. This is a tenuous time, and yet we're blessed beyond measure, and yet we hardly know it. Who among you will deliver that roar? I want to close by sharing with you one of the most poignant lessons I ever learned. I learned it here at Washington Lee, actually. I learned it in a class I was taking. I forget if I was a sophomore or a junior. I was about 19, maybe 20 years old. It was a sociology class. We were studying the Yanomamo Indians. I don't know why I even remember this, except for probably because of what happened that day. And this was an indigenous tribe in the Amazon River jungle. Perhaps some of you have taken that same class. Maybe it's still offered. We were studying the Yanomamo Indians. And there were certain beliefs that they had as to their origins. And somebody asked a question, how is it possible that people could believe you're descended from a flying elephant named Paraboriwa and that the blood of that elephant hit the earth after being struck by arrows shot by people that we don't know how they got there, and from that blood sprang these people. I remember this vividly. Again, I remember nothing else from that class. I remember this because of what happened on that day. In response to that question, the professor, who I truly don't even remember who it was, started to make sort of snide and sarcastic remarks about religious beliefs in general of anybody, beliefs of origin of anyone, and specifically mocked Christianity and Judeo-Christian belief system. And we all sat there like sheep and listened to it, every one of us. I was never a kid while I'd been raised in a home with good, strong Judeo-Christian principles and believed that you respect God, respect your parents, respect other people, treat people the way you want to be treated. This is how I was raised. I wasn't a part of FCA. I wasn't part of InterVarsity Christian Athletes, even though I was an athlete. I wasn't a part of anything that might have caused people to look to me and say, hey, I hope Bevan says something. And I didn't, and nobody did. We sat there. And the mockery went on, and the ridiculousness of it got more ridiculous. And this professor, I remember, was sort of feeling like they were a bit on a roll. And finally, I'd had enough. And I was like any number one, any of you that are sitting here. I wasn't that spectacular. I really wasn't. There was nothing about me that should have made me be the person. But in that moment, somebody needed to say something. And after sitting there and listening to it for quite some time, I decided that that somebody was going to have to be me. Because let me tell you something. How many of you in your lives, you don't need to show hands, how many of you have ever said, boy, I hope somebody does this, or I hope somebody does that, I hope somebody runs for office that I believe in, I hope somebody will take care of cleaning up this mess in our dorm room, I hope somebody will do this, I hope somebody will do that. Well, guess what? Sometimes the somebody is always somebody. Sometimes the somebody is you. The somebody is always somebody. Why should the somebody not be you? In this case, the somebody was me. And so I raised my hand and I made a comment and I just said, you know, I find this to be a little bit offensive at many levels and frankly, it's a bad analogy to boot and I made some counterpoint. What do you suppose the very first response that this teacher had it was to ridicule and to mock, which is often what you find. When the truth rises up or conviction rises up or something substantive rises up, that which is cynical and small and shallow will often deride, it will mock, it will ridicule, it will try to shame, it will try to embarrass. Partially because of how I grew up, frankly, that doesn't work well with me. It really doesn't. And so frankly, that just, I dug in. 
And it started to go back and forth, and then the tide turned because, frankly, there was nothing substantive on the other side but the ridicule. And as we started to go back and forth a little bit, in, frankly, a way that wasn't so brilliant that I even remember it, except for the fact that the tide began to turn a little bit. And now, suddenly, the students were starting to laugh at the professor and snicker a little bit. And that wasn't fun for that individual. And I remember then he gave a sort of false apology and just said, listen, I didn't mean to offend anybody, and certainly, why don't we just move on? And so we did move on. The reason I remember this, the reason I share it with you right now, is because not of that moment, which was just another moment in a classroom in time that would have been forgotten had it not been for what happened in the moments immediately after class, in the days, and even the weeks on campus after class. I'll bet 85% of the kids in that class at one point or another came up to me on campus and thanked me for saying something including kids who didn't even believe necessarily in what it was that I was saying, but they thanked me for saying something. There were some who said, gee, I wanted to say something. I wanted to, to, to speak up, but I figured that I might get laughed at. I figured I'd get ridiculed. And then when that started to happen to you, I was glad I didn't say something. I was glad I didn't speak up. But I'm glad you did. Almost every kid in that class said that to me over the course of the next two, three weeks. That's what I remember. I was struck by the fact that there was a time and a place to stand up. And at that time, while I was the age of so many of you in this room, I vowed I would never be silent when something needed to be said. There was a man, Martin Niemöller, was a Protestant minister, was jailed by the Nazis. Some of you are probably familiar with this. He was held in a Nazi prison camp. Afterwards, he lived through that, and afterwards he was asked about his experience how it was that he as a Protestant came to be imprisoned there. And he very famously said, first they came for the communists. And I wasn't a communist, so I didn't say anything. And then they came for the trade unionists. I wasn't a trade unionist, so I didn't say anything. And then they came for the Jews. And I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't say anything. And then they came for me. And there was nobody to speak for me. Speak up. Don't be sheep. The world needs shepherds like they have never needed shepherds before. The world needs you to have a sense of seriousness and a sense of conviction and a sense of, of courage, the likes of which has rarely been exemplified in the history of the world. It has been. We know who those people are. Be those people. Step up like you've never stepped up. If you've ever cared, care now. If you've ever been invested, and be invested now. If you've ever paid attention, pay attention now. The world needs you like it has never needed courage and conviction before. Do not be a sheep. You are a room full of shepherds. Get out there and lead people. Lead people with courage and conviction. I pray for my children for two things, two very specific things. It's something I pray for with them when I'm with them and when I'm not with them. I prayed it silently. I've prayed it with them out loud. It's what I pray for each and every one of you at the same time. I pray that they will have wisdom. Because we live in a screwy world. We live in a mixed up world. We live in a world where increasingly for your generation, we're telling you that in is out and up is down and right is wrong. There is absolute right and wrong. It is not all relative. It's one of the greatest lies that has been perpetrated upon mankind and upon your generation in particular. There is absolute right and wrong. I pray that they will have the wisdom to know what is right, what is the right thing to do in every circumstance. But I also pray that they will have some second thing, and that is courage. Because there's a lot of people who know the right thing to do. There's a lot of people who know what the right thing is to do, but they lack the conviction and the courage to do it. And so my prayer for each and every one of you, each and every one of you, those that will have the luxury and the blessing and the joy of spending years yet to come on this campus, and those of you who will, in a matter of months, be leaving here and going out into the real world, I pray for each of you that you will have wisdom, that you will know the right thing to do, and that you will have the courage to do it because the world needs you. Be the shepherds. God bless you and thank you for this opportunity.